Thanks, Dinda. I think that the title that you chose of Tragedy Meets Comedy is a pretty good description. This is a very tragicomic film. There's plenty of mischief in it, plenty of little jokes and gags. We've got songs, we've got a little bit of everything. We don't necessarily have a happy ending. So to me, the film is also a little bit puzzling. It is one of my favorite films of the 1930s. I've been spending the last few years really delving into an archive of early Chinese films from the silent era, pretty much up to when the communists won the civil war and started nationalizing the film industry. So I've been looking at this early black and white epoch and Street Angels is really a standout film in a number of ways. And so I wanted to talk about a few perspectives that I think are interesting and maybe are not apparent at first glance if you're watching this film for the first time. And so I thought that I would kind of share a few perspectives um, I'm not going to say too much about Yuan Muzhi, the director, although at the end, I want to recommend to you one of his other films, which he made two years before Street Angels. This is a film called City Scenes from 1935, and it's another sound film, a very uh, unusual one. But Street Angels 2 is a film that has had a lot of longevity, despite being a, a little bit of a mishmash. There are elements from silent cinema that come through very, very strongly. We have a kind of bizarre uh, plot arc. We've got references to war. And then I think there are also some things going on in terms of film history and including international film history that you really need to have, like be familiar with the films of the 1930s to recognize. So I want to walk through a few things, maybe spend about you know 40 minutes or so talking about how Street Angels was impacted and relates to the history of war in China how it relates to global cinema and Hollywood in particular. There's some clear Hollywood elements that you can see in Street Angels. And the standout actor in the film is uh, clearly Zhou Xuan, the golden voice. So this was a teenage star who was, had been famous already as a singer and was not making her debut on screen, but this was really a breakout role for her. And she's paired with Zhao Dan, right, this heartthrob actor. Uh, who was also quite young at that time. And this is a film that has been on rotation in China for quite a while. Actually, I was recently talking to one of my neighbors who grew up in Beijing and said, you know, I'd never heard of Goddess, Shen Yu, that 1934 Drowning Yu silent film, but I had seen Street Angels. I remember watching Zhao Dan and uh, Zhou Xuan in this film, and it was, it was charming. Um, and so this is a film that I think has had some staying power in China and, and deserves to be considered a classic. And I think a lot of that classic status has to do with the two songs that Zhou Xuan sings in it. So I wanted to talk a bit about how this relates to the musical genre, like musical films, and also some things that go beyond the songs in terms of innovative things of, about sound design that Yuan Muzhi does. That um, again, I've, I've taught this film for a few years. I've, I've watched it many times. These are just a few things that jumped out at me. And then I'll share some other further viewings. So just to recap, these are the main uh, people that we see, the main street angels of street angels. So we have Xiao Hong, uh, played by Zhou Xuan. And interestingly, Xiao Hong is actually Zhou Xuan's uh, given name in real life. Now we have Xiao Yun, who is, you know, she refers to as her elder sister. And so we have a songstress and then we have a prostitute. And these two are kind of a pair. And it's almost like Xiao Yun represents what Xiao Hong could become if she's not careful. We have these three stooge-ish characters in supporting roles that add a little bit of light comedy and slapstick to the proceedings. We have Xiao Hong's uh, love interest, Chen Xiaoping, who is a kind of marginally employed musician and uh, a lot, all these characters are really, really precarious. And, you know, another member of the group who's not shown here is Old Wang, the newspaper seller, played by Wei Heling, uh, who's also a, a very charismatic figure. And so we're taken into this world of these characters in these so-called slums of Shanghai. So it's partly a social expose. And so I want to talk a little bit about, you know, why are we there? And what kind of stories are being told through these characters? But they are, uh, our main character is a refugee from war. And so there were indeed some actual international conflicts that shaped street angels. 
So this is a film that was released in Shanghai in July 1937. And for students of Chinese history, you know, July 1937 marked the kind of official uh, start of the Second Sino-Japanese War or the Anti-Japanese War, the Marco Polo Bridge incident you know, up near Beijing happened near this military skirmish. And then later in the year, you know, by the fall, the Japanese are bombing and invading Shanghai. And so you have this mass exodus from Shanghai where the Chinese film industry was located. And so this is a film that was made mostly in the spring of 1937, before war had broken out. Um, but it, it refers to an earlier conflict. So China had been in an undeclared war with Japan essentially since 1931. And this film uh, specifically, it doesn't use the term, but it refers to the 1931 Mukden incident where Japan, the Japanese army kind of used this uh, fabricated a pretext to invade and occupy Northeastern China. And so we see actually representations of that 1931 conflict and it is narrativized. It's like Xiao Hong's life. The reason she's in Shanghai is because she was fleeing from that war. So we have this wartime backdrop. And again, there's no mention of Japan, right? Or the particular en uh, enemy or invader, but audiences at this time would be very, very clear. We have a story set in 1935 and this is referring to events in 1931 and 1932. And, you know, Pui was you know, brought in as kind of a puppet ruler of this Japanese state, which lasted from 1932 to 1945. So it lasted until the end of World War II, pretty much. And again, we see these, the heartless blow, you know, from the invader that separates the lovers in the song. And this is not the only wartime film. So I think you could, you could look at Street Angels in relation to other wartime films and films that are even made just on the cusp of war. So another um, great musical film from 1937 from that same year is Song at Midnight, Ye Ban Ge Sheng. It's in a very, very different key. It's in a horror key. And it borrows a lot from Phantom of the Opera. But this was released just a few months earlier. A lot of splashy advertisements, you know, playing up the Gothic horror, but it's also a musical. And the filmmakers also weaved in kind of a revolutionary um, and socially conscious story, uh, referring to earlier um, internecine conflict in China. And you know, shortly after Street Angels was made, you had, again, the outbreak of full-scale war. The film industry gets divided. So a lot of the Shanghai filmmakers move to Hong Kong or move to Chongqing, the wartime capital of the nationalists. But some people stay in Shanghai and keep making films. And so ironically, one of the most patriotic films of the early war period, uh, this uh, Hua Mulan film from 1939, is about, um, it was made by people who actually had to collaborate with the Japanese invaders in order to distribute their films in a lot of China. Uh, so uh, this is a very controversial film. It was distributed you know, as far as Japan and you know, Hong Kong, but it was burned in the streets because of its politics um, and the kind of off-screen politics of working with the Japanese. So this is a very, very um, precarious time, not just in the stories being told, but also in the industry. And so if you're curious about the kind of later history of the war, uh, you might you know, read about films like Diao Chan. This is about one of the old beauties of uh, pre-modern China, or a particularly interesting one that I hope we can get translated eventually is this you know, more than two hour blockbuster called Eternity in which you have a collaboration between Shanghai cinema and Manchukuo cinema. And you have a you know, Japanese actress who is passing as Chinese, Li Xianglan, appearing alongside Chen Yunshang, who had starred as Mulan just a few years earlier. And it's an interesting film, partly because of the hilarious depictions of foreigners played by Chinese actors in whiteface. And these are not at all scary, um, uh, scary creatures, right? This is set during the Opium War, but they're more laughable than uh, terrible. So, and, you know, there are other films like Confucius. There are a lot of costume dramas that went on, but essentially Street Angels was made just before this major shift towards costume drama and towards allegory. But we still see some allegory in the film. And some of the plot points, like the Mukden incident, carried on for years afterwards. 
So one of the most profitable films of the 1940s, Spring River Flows East, this two-part film, kind of like on the scale of Gone with the Wind, it opens in 1931. So it refers to the same conflict that you have in Street Angels. So that's just a little bit about the wartime backdrop, but I think there's some interesting things about global cinema as well. And there are international industry factors that um, some people who have watched the film growing up in China may not realize. So one is that the film actually is part, the title is partly inspired by a Hollywood film, uh, Street Angel, which uh, was a, you know, was distributed in China in Shanghai. It won an Oscar for Best Actress for, by Janet Gaynor's performance. You have images of her, you know, looking out a window, kind of similar to Zhou Shen's character. And so this is also about a street urchin in a precarious situation. And this is pretty common. You see this in a lot of, um, you know, copying of titles um, and titles being inspired by Hollywood films. So don't change your husband. What is that about? Kind of a, a social expose, very anti-divorce or orphans of the storm. You have an orphan of the storm made in China and two, a few years after D.W. Griffith's film. So you could look at Street Angels within this type of continuum. And um, I should also mention that around this time, the majority of the films being screened in China were actually foreign films. And this continued pretty much up until Pearl Harbor in 1941. So um, the expectation I think we should have when we watch Chinese films of this era, like Street Angels, is that actually audiences were very, very familiar with these stories and tropes from international cinema as well. So let's take a, um, actually I was gonna show a clip from Street Angels, but I think I'm just gonna jog your memory. You can watch the clip online uh, yourself um, if you're interested on chinesefilmclassics.org. But you remember that opening sequence where we have a parade through the streets of Shanghai and it's for a wedding. And we kind of see uh, this montage of all these different images. We get the snare drum and then uh, it kind of zooms in on this trumpeter who's not getting his cue and he's reminded to do that. And then he looks up and he sees this young woman at the window. So let's take a look at one other film from around the same time that was uh, from Hollywood. And let me know if anything looks familiar to you. So you get a sense from just that clip that um, there are some similarities here, right? Where we have woman, a woman or women in the balcony and a man in the parade and musical numbers as well. And I think there are other things you could point out too, right? I didn't show you the uh, clip from uh, Street Angels, but we have a progression from kind of a jolly, happy, you know, somewhat comic um, performance into a somewhat somber note at the end, right? Where we see this widow go by in her carriage and the smiling man starts to frown. So there's no uh, changing to, fr in frowns, uh, to frowns at the end of the Street Angels sequence until uh, we have Xiao Hong be called back inside by her foster father who forces her to sing. But uh, I spent some time looking at contemporary print culture and reading recent scholarship about this era. And Maurice Chevalier was, uh, in the words of Paul Fonaroff, China's first talkie superstar. So I think some of the circumstantial evidence for a link between the Merry Widow and Street Angels is uh, pretty strong here, that he was very, very popular. And so it seemed natural that a director like Yuan Mujir would take inspiration from his films. But Zhou Xuan is clearly the star of our show here. And I think it is her performance that really uh, made this film a hit. So she sings a couple songs. Song of the Four Seasons is the first one we hear around minute seven. And then Songstress at the Ends of the Earth, we actually hear twice. One when it's Xiao Hong and Chen Xiaoping singing across the alley and he's playing the Arhu. And then a second time where she sings for him and her foster father, uh, an abusive character, plays the Arhu. And Chen Xiaoping is in the uh, restaurant or tea house as a customer, and he's like paying for her to sing. So it becomes this like cheap transactional relationship. So that's a very, very powerful scene. But uh, Zhou Xuan had a long career, right? She began in a kind of song and dance troupe. She was recruited into the film industry. She had a great uh, screen test, obviously. Her picture is all over the uh, print media of this period, right? All these glamor shots. And uh, we have an image of her with uh, Zhao Huishen, who she co-stars with, right? Her elder sister. 
plays her elder sister in Street Angels, from the studio fanzine, right, by the Star Film Company that produced this film. And, but her career lasted for quite a while. So 1948, you know, over a decade and a war later, she's still a cover girl. And this was the year when she had appeared in a kind of controversial late career hit. This is another musical film where she plays a concubine or courtesan to an, em an emperor who is suffering under Tsusi, the Empress Dowager's thumb, but is very reform minded. But Mao Zedong like pinpointed this film as a reactionary film and criticized it heavily. So it was very, very controversial. But I, I think Zhou Xuan's stardom continued into the early People's Republic. You still have this kind of late, uh, late blooming um, in print culture and a little bit in studio of the old star culture from the Republic. Unfortunately, she died um, of poor health and she had suffered some mental health issues uh, late in life and uh, passed away in 1937. But a, a lot of her voice and her persona has been very influential and become kind of a symbol of old Shanghai. So if you, if you read a book like Wang Yi's Song of Everlasting Sorrow, which Michael Berry and Susan Chen Egan translated, it's a, a song that comes up a lot as like part of the acoustic and sensual dimensions of old Shanghai. Uh, 